Welcome to the final talk in our six week, um, well it's seven weeks since we had to reschedule one, um, teach Eleanor William Hooker Tea Talks presented by the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail. And I'm happy to say the series have been really, really, really well attended. Um, some really great dialogues. And hopefully today we'll continue the trend. Um, it's been standing room only for a lot of the talks. So what that tells us is that there is definitely a need for these conversations. And when we are coming at, at the end of our program today, I'll um, just ask also for some ideas and thoughts on what you want to hear next year when we um, re uh, reintroduce the program once again. Um, my name is Jerry Ann Bogus, and I'm the director for the Black Heritage, the new executive director for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. And with me is Sandy Clark from the Seacoast African American Cultural Center. Um, we're sponsoring these tea talks together, and today we're really going to take a look at, through personal stories, how do we, the ways in which we move from, from those to come to reconciliation. So we had all our fighting moments, which we're still having. <laughs> Don't want to forget those. But also, too, to really look at what's going on in our country now, what has been going on. We'll draw, uh, we'll draw a comparison between apartheid in South Africa and racism here in the U.S. We'll look at how um, forced assimilation and uh, the killing off of a culture through Native Americans, um, who actually were First Nation people here, not white Europeans. <laughs> and then we'll figure out just you know some of the things that other countries who have gone through the, these really traumatic um, uh, killing off of one group of people and how they've been able to come together as a group to to bring their country back into some kind of peaceful union. So with us today, we have a real um, a stellar panel that we're looking forward to hear from. Unfortunately, because we had to reschedule this talk, two of our panelists could not make it. But in your package is uh, the essay by um, Jason Sokoff on Reconstructed North, where he looks at you know, the myth about the North being, you know, free of racism, you know, the, and so we'll talk, uh, we'll try to get into that in our talk as well. And um, Sandy, not Sandy, <laughs> Sheila, Sheila was not able, she's in South Carolina and just wasn't able to make this date. So we wanted to keep going and we're happy to have with us um, Pimpia Burroughs. <coughs> Um, she will talk about uh, reconciliation with the um, Abenaki tribe up in Maine. We're, we have um, Eleanor Dunphy. Should I take our seats? Uh, we're going to show a film first, if that's okay. If, if you can. And then, um, and then Willard Lett, who is work, um, sorry, Eleanor will talk about her work with the Truth and Reconciliation um, process in South Africa. And Willard will talk about the new or not so new initiative about reparations for African American enslaved African Americans here in the U.S. I'll go. Okay. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Penthia Burns, and um, <coughs> I am the co-director of a program called Maine Wabanaki Reach, um, <coughs> and um, have been. Um, just in five minutes, how to summarize how we got to this point. Um, I want to talk today some about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that occurred in Maine. Um, and um, the origins of that began uh, in 1999 <coughs> for me. I began working at the Muskie School of Public Service at the University of Southern Maine and had uh, a one-year project that was uh, to uh, design with um, the tribal child welfare programs and the state child welfare programs a training that would train all of the state child welfare staff um, on federal laws related to Indian child welfare. Because Maine, with every other state in the nation, 
was found to not be in compliance with this federal law, uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978. You saw a reference to it in the film. Um, same year as some, some other pretty uh, major legislation passed related to um, Native American rights. Um, <clears throat> so we completed this training. Um, uh, well, the first day that we got in the room together, uh, the degree of mistrust between the state child welfare folks and the tribal child welfare folks, as you can imagine, was pretty, uh, pretty thick. Um, and the, there's five tribes in the state of Maine, uh, five tribal communities in the state of Maine, actually five tribes. The Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet are up in the northernmost part of the state in Arista County. Uh, in Penobscot County um, is the Penobscot Nation, right on, uh, on the river. Um, and uh, in Washington County, what we call down east in Maine, uh, is the uh, Passamaquoddy tribe, who have two separate reservations, which is tied to the history of the Christian church uh, in their communities. Um, so we we'll probably touch on that today, too. Um, at any rate, that, that initial mistrust uh, and misgiving about what the state might want, um, each of the tribal programs um, pretty quickly said, you know, we'll work on this because it is our children, it's our families that are suffering. And uh, so we created the training and, um, and after um, doing the training for all of the state staff, it was pretty clear that we really hadn't even begun. Uh, that there was so much more training really is not a panacea to um, the kind of history that um, that they have faced or that we have um, perpetrated. Um, so we continued working and uh, did some really cool stuff. We changed policies, we created case review systems, you know, the kind of things that um, seem to be helpful. But underneath it all, was the history of genocide and assimilation and racism and um, and uh, white privilege that we hadn't really begun to touch on yet, and and we began to realize somewhere and um, after probably six or seven years of working together that we really needed to do something different. That until we looked back and recognized and acknowledged what has happened going forward was going to be forever sort of sucked down by um, um, the power of the past. And, um, and the past isn't too long ago when we look at current events. The past is what happened just a few minutes ago. Um, so, um, so we began working on uh, designing a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was eventually seated in 2012. There's lots more to say about that. Um, the commission uh, had 27 months to, um, to investigate the experiences of Wabanaki people um, in the state child welfare system from the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 to the present day. Uh, and you saw some of their findings there, they did that. Um, <clears throat> those of us who worked on organizing the commission uh, realized that uh, our role changed. Our role was to support uh, the Wabanaki communities to be ready for this commission, to find people who would want to speak with them about their experiences with the state child welfare system. It was to do work in the non-native communities to educate them about uh, this happening and why it was happening, and to find people who had been involved with the state child welfare system who could talk about what they did and what they thought that they were doing. Um, and then uh, I think it took us probably um, a very short amount of time doing this work that we realized that um, this is not just about child welfare, that this is about the social context within which child welfare sits. Uh, our correction system looks the same, that the Native people are um, in the correction system at the highest um, disproportionate rate uh, for any other population, and, um, and many of those connected to the child welfare system um, in their childhood or um, in the present day. Uh, so we began to um, broaden our education to try and understand what in history brought us to this point. Um, and signal me when I should start wrapping up. <laughs>
because I get a lot, I get a lot of material. Um, so, so some of what I want to say is that it, you know, caused us to look really far back in history, you know, so that we're understanding the colonization of this country, you know, looking at um, the early thousands and into 1400s with the, the decrees that came from Rome that charged the explorers uh, that they not only had the right, but they had the duty to go out and explore, to claim new lands that were not inhabited by Christians for Christ and for the crown. And, uh, and so when we look at um, across history and how that, what's called the doctrine of discovery, Later here, we referred to it as what manifest destiny um, and how that became embedded in our legal system with Supreme Court decisions that cited that uh, and gave um, a sense of dominance to um, our institutions and structures to be able to take what we wanted, to take this land, to displace Native people, and to use a series of strategies in order to get that land, including um, what was referred to in the film, the boarding schools, taking children and and um, enforcing on strategies of assimilation um, so that the the reservations could be broken up and that land could be made available and that we could have access to all of it. So it tie I mean all that stuff ties together into what we thought was going to be, well, one, a one-year project, but even that we thought it was going to be solely focused on child welfare became a much bigger thing. So, more to say as we go on. Which way do I want? Okay. Thank you. And it, it's really a privilege to be a part, a small part, of sharing this story. And sadly, everything we've seen to this moment is reflected in my experience uh, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. I was thinking it can be a different culture, a different continent, but the underlying indignity that it reflects is harrowing. Um, so it was about 6.30 one morning in Cape Town, June 25th, 1996, that I was headed out and went to the hotel lobby where there was a single doorman. No one else gets up that early in South Africa. Oh, Dan, a bit. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I was waiting for a ride, and the gentleman came over and was very gracious, and he said, where are you going at this hour? And I said, I'm going up to Worcester County, outside of Cape Town, to a truth and reconciliation hearing. And he pulled back a bit and looked at me and said, oh, that is really something. And here is this very gentle giant of an African black man saying to me then, you know, I have a problem with this commission, this whole idea. He said, I just think since Mandela, so it was two years, you know, since Mandela became president, I think we need to put these things behind us and go forward. It's 6.30 in the morning and I wasn't even thinking at that point and I was so taken aback. I, I found myself saying to him, oh, I really admire you. I, I just think it's amazing. I said, but you know, I think we did something like that in the United States. We did a lot of things like that in the United States. But what came out right away was, for instance, the Vietnam War. When those veterans came home, we, we almost denied their existence and the existence of what had happened. And we put it under cover so that we could forget it. You know, we ban what we don't want to admit. And I said, I think maybe this might at least be a help. And so we had that very nice exchange. My car picked me up in the only other traffic were the vans 
In fact, I jotted this down so that I could say it completely quickly. The only others on the street were overused and overcrowded vans, looking like they had seen better days, stopping at designated street corners to deliver their passengers who should have seen better days, but had not. So that these work and life-worn black South Africans from the townships could fan out to the menial but essential labor that was the engine of the economies of the cities in South Africa. I again wondered how that doorman could have felt that bygones be bygones. But I hadn't even scratched the bloody surface of the evil of apartheid. I was about, however, to witness 40 minutes later in Worcester County, where his Archbishop Tutu and his wife and family had invited us to attend one of the Truth and Reconciliation hearings at a local high school auditorium. The Archbishop, who prefers to be called Arch, uh, would be presiding. He, he encouraged us to sit in the front rows so that people could see that it, even Americans were interested in this. Because part of the stories being shared, part of the process was to recognize them beyond what that woman so beautifully and sadly said, the, themselves. And so our being there was symbolic as well. So recalling at that moment the brief exchange I had with the hotel doorman, I looked up at the banner on the stage, and I think that will be the next. Do we have, um, yeah. Um, the, the banner, Truth and Recon Reconciliation, and it's Truth, the Road to Reconciliation. And I think that's where the doorman and I had been trying to grapple with the reality. The, um, I wanted to show just a few slides of the actual hearing and pass around after some of the, the program and the testimony. And afterward, you can pick up a couple of pages that I copy just so you would have some of the information that I'm going to just go through very quickly here. Um, I, I, oh. <laughs> so I wanted to put it in a time frame. When you think of apartheid at its peak, we forget that it goes back. It was 50, 60 years of a 300 year history. But when the laws of apartheid apart pulling people apart, so antithetical to Ubuntu, which means I become myself as I relate to you. We become ourselves. The same, the cultural embedded um, nature that was just ripped apart. So the purpose of this Reconciliation Commission, established by the post-apartheid government, was to help remove, remove beyond the retribution and the violence that plagued so many countries transitioning from oppression to democracy. That was at the heart of it. Mandela had said, um, we can either spend the next hundred years in court and in punishment and more blood, or we can look at this beautiful nation of ours and spend it rebuilding it together. So at the heart, philosophically, that's what was supposed to be happening. Um, that addresses restorative justice rather than retributive justice. And that's a tough one. Because when we are so hurt, as we saw in that uh, testimony, it is very, very hard to get over it. And restorative means the possibility of forgiveness and a new beginning for the greater good. President Mandela could have raised his hand that day in the stadium and said, 
we're out to get even. And South Africa today would not be the product of a peaceful revolution. Even with its great problems today, it still is an amazing, amazing story. So in post-conflict areas of the world, taking South Africa's model, the essence was that someone could get amnesty if the crime was political in nature and if the person told the truth. They could also ask forgiveness that was not required, and some did and some didn't. It was a very steep bar, though, to climb over because over 7,000 applications, 21,000 were at, um, over the whole of it telling their stories, but 7,000 applications only yielded 849 uh, amnesties. So it was not, as some people said, it was, oh my, you're just giving people a chance to forget the horrible crimes that they committed. Um, so when we go on um, the mandate, I think I just covered that, um, so we'll go to the next. The process, from the local to the national, people gathered. It was very interesting um, to hear and to you, um, uh, Pantia, and recognize this, the process of story being the heart of the entire process. Um, one of the most important points that really impressed me was the, the essential nature of making sure that every venue, wherever these were held, and they were held locally first and then regionally, and then people would choose whether or not they wanted to go to the next step and really get up to the final stage. But the venue had to be a dignified one. There were always flowers. There were always um, tablecloths where the um, victim sat always a counselor next to that person. Um, the, the entire commission, usually four or five at a, a hearing, when the person would break down and cry, they'd say, take your time, take your time. That would be broadcast on the radio and it would be in the newspapers the next day. That was another requirement. And not everybody was very happy about this with, they used to deride Archbishop Tutu by saying, oh, the handkerchief commission is on again. And I was so touched by seeing that woman who is um, passionate and, and she couldn't even contain herself. And there was a box of tissues in front of her. I'm sure I'm the only one that would notice the box of Kleenex in that. No. But it, it really was a symbol, you know, that these were heart-wrenching stories um, of people, people like any, any other human being. So um, as we went in, and I think I also covered that. Speak so, into the mic, please. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, no, I was a teacher, would you? <laughs> okay. Um, so, in summary, South Africa chose to say no to amnesia, yes to remembering, and that's compromise. There, there is no either or to say no to full-scale prosecution and yes to forgiveness. So, to do that re, ex, um, required that you would be satisfied with um, an outcome that wasn't perfect. So if any effort <coughs> for truth and reconciliation is initiated, we have to be ready not to get everything, but to talk and deal with the most important parts. And that, of course, is the human case of compromise. And so people that were against the commission would say that. These people are getting away with this. And, and it was a very long 
journey to try to affect that. And I have, there is the arch. Yep. Having to sit, yep. um, having to sit and listen to some of the most horrendous stories in the TRC and coming to realize human beings' extraordinary capacity for evil. I've also been exhilarated by the fact of our having such an extraordinary capacity for good. And he would weep at listening. And when you heard even some of the stories, you would know why he was weeping. Um, again, I thought seeing physically what the venue looks like, and you can move to the next, another. So the commissioners were here, and those who were uh, the victims and a, and a council would be sit, uh, seated right across and they would introduce each victim and then either the victim would share his or her story or if he couldn't speak, um, the council would. Um, and this is how he introduced that hearing and I'm sure others. Never tire of listening to each and every story. They are all the same, and they are all unique. And I think if we're going to take on any kind of reconciliation, we have to consider. Because people say, I've heard it before. No, you haven't. You might have heard parts, but every story is unique. And that was Archbishop Tutu's wonderful ability to zero in on that dignity of the individual. Can it work elsewhere? <coughs> First of all, um, and you had this in me, it has to be government mandated. And I might be able to save some of this for the, for the um, conversation. I perhaps mm -hmm. should just leave it there. And, um, just end it, this section by sharing with you two brief stanzas. One victim who had been in from age 12 from going to a funeral of a, a, a woman whom he lived with who was like a grandmother and he was shot. That's where they would try to shoot because they knew they would be gathering. And so he, he did not speak from um, in a narrative. He spoke his poem, of which I'll just read two stanzas. For a crime I didn't commit, I was detained and convicted for 90 days and 19, 19, 90 nights without a trial, without a trial in solitary confinement and solitary confusion, alone, all alone, with no one to talk to, no visit allowed, from my beloved ones, no visit permitted, from my beloved ones who didn't even know my whereabouts, alone, all alone. And that now man at 37 <coughs> in a wheelchair had been shot by the security forces right in that town, Worcester, and <coughs> was still living, his family and the rest were still living with that secure, with the people on that security force right there in the town. The next day, everything that they said was in the newspaper. I'll end today at the end with a story of the effectiveness of that. Um, and I will pass these around and perhaps leave this section to Willard now to, by saying that what amazed me is that children were taken away from the Abenakis and others. Um, men were taken away in South Africa to go work in the diamond mines and other, other things. And yet the result was the same. The purpose was to break up the family 
where culture is initially um, given to us. And by breaking up the family, they were able to succeed to a degree. Um, I think, Willard, you're going to take us up to um, a later time now in our own. And I'll say what I have that applies to current until then. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm taking us to a uh, later or an earlier time. Probably, <laughs> probably both. <laughs> because uh, when we look at the South African experience, we know that they learned much of what they applied in developing their apartheid system from how the Europeans here in the U.S. US dealt with African and First Nations people, uh, both in terms of their uh, apartheid and its policy of segregation, which was developed uh, you know, as a social policy with people of African descent, and with the South African policy of Bantu stands, or these separate nations, which was based on the First Nations American policy of reservations. Um, but uh, <clears throat> rather than but, I'll say and. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, reparations and the uh, movement for reparations for African chattel slavery uh, here in the U.S. And um, I define reparations as repair and rehabilitation to heal the human family. You know, um, back in 1492, uh, in the European world, both uh, the scientific and academic world, uh, their, view, their viewpoint and their understanding was that the world was flat, Earth was the center of the universe, and Africans and other non-Europeans were less than fully human. Well, over time, um, you know, the uh, Europeans circum circumnavigated the globe, and they decided, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe the world's not flat. And uh, uh, over time, with uh, Copernicus and, and Newton and Sputnik, they ended up, um, you know, looking and discovering that actually the Earth was at the center of the universe, and the sun didn't circle around the Earth, even though. You know, every morning, uh, the idea that it did was based on this uh, apparent fact by seeing the sun rise in the east and set in the west and come up in the east again every day. And, uh, but in more recently, the human genome was sequenced. And through looking at the uh, human genome and, and looking at these uh, categories uh, called race and people in these categories, it was discovered that there was more difference within the category than between the category, which uh, actually proved scientifically that there was no such thing as race. But the uh, European encounter with the African people uh, has always been characterized by this dehumanization of the African personality and the European imagination. And uh, that idea and that experience uh, was coded into these terms called uh, uh, black and white. And uh, these uh, labels were shorthand for uh, how power and privilege was distributed and disseminated in society. And it was connected to, just like uh, uh, the Europeans thought the world was flat because when they looked out across the land, they didn't see a tree kind of hanging off the side of the earth at the curvature. You know, they thought that the um, sun revolved around the earth by watching the sun come up and go down, you know, uh, come up in the east and, and set in the west and come up again in the east the next day. Well, similarly, they, uh, after this experience of uh, the dehumanization of the African personality, in the European imagination that was related to the presence of melanin. And those who were melanin deficient were considered fully human. And those who were melanin enhanced were considered less than human. 
So this uh, apparent difference based on the presence of melanin was the basis for this idea. And even though refuted by science, we still today continue to uh, propagate this mistaken notion by referring to ourselves and others uh, in this same way, using those same labels. You know, uh, uh, we, we know that our friend um, Albert Einstein said, you can't solve a problem at the same level of thinking that created it. <laughs> and so, you know, this idea that uh, people were black or white was the basis in the justification for African chattel slavery. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people will tell you and say that, well, you, I mean, there's always been slavery, and there's even slavery today. But one of the unique things about the uh, uh, slavery experience in the Americans, particularly for Africans, was that it was chattel slavery. You weren't just not compensated for your work, but you were considered property. And many of those folk who today say that property are people with the um, Citizens United decision, and they talk about the uh, economic elite and the 1%, uh, then said that people were property. You know, it's the same or very similar proposition. So when we talk about um, reparations, we're talking about what happened in the past, but also what has continued to happen because the, the intellectual architecture that provided the justification for this uh, social relationship has continued uh, un, you know, unassailed, you know, and pr pretty much unquestioned even today, you know, and we see it uh, and reflected in these ideas called race and in these labels called black and white, you know, and part of the problem with that is uh, that uh, it ends up that's that what you know it ends up keeping us in that same place, keeping us in the box, because there are certain kinds of characteristics there that are attributed to those labels, certain kinds of uh, and results and bias and uh, expectations that we work at, at, at manifesting in our relationships. So um, when we start talking about reparations, we're really uh, saying that, particularly reparations for African chattel slavery in the U.S., we're saying that we're not just talking about the uh, period of enslavement, but we're talking about the dehumanization of the African personality in the European imagination that has continued to reproduce those same kinds of negative outcomes in the lives of African people here in the U.S. from 1619 till today. You know, in spite of uh, 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 various changes in, in laws and even uh, social policies. Uh, one thing that, that happened around 2001, the uh, United Nations uh, through the World uh, Conference uh, Against uh, Racism and Xenophobia declared the uh, transatlantic uh, European enslavement system as a crime against humanity because when we say that we are not, when, when we present the proposition that reparations is about repair and re rehabilitation. We're saying that the work that has to be done is to uh, reunite and repair and heal the human family. Because, you know, uh, I'm not black, I'm human. You're not white, you're human. And unless we can move into that space where we're working together to bring about that, that healing, then we're going to have similar kinds of uh, challenges going forward, you know. Uh, so when we talk about reparations, we're not talking, we are saying that, well, you know, there, we will need resources to do the work. But we're not just talking about restitution. And we're also not talking about charity. You know, the issue is not what it, will someone else give, you know, what will one group give to the other group? Because we're saying we're the same group. And we're talking about, you know, healing each other. So reparations is repair. And repair requires um, resources, which in some instances would be restitution, but it also includes dealing with both individual and institutional change, dealing with personal and policy change. But it, it, and in this relationship is not just about the Africans. Reparations is also about the Europeans. 
who were involved in this relationship. And we were talking about, in terms of the uh, U Europeans, we were talking about rehabilitation. You know, we're talking about um, uh, acknowledgement and atonement. One example that we see of an instance where uh, uh, people were dehumanized and then rehumanized or their humanity acknowledged was what happened with the Jews in Germany. You know, and uh, they, Israel was part of their uh, uh, reparations with all the problems that might have. And they're even still receiving reparations payments from uh, you know countries around the world because it was recognized that that was a that what happened to those people was a crime against humanity. But not only uh, uh, did the uh, Jews receive uh, this uh, you know restitution and resources, but also the German people themselves underwent and are engaged in a process of rehabilitation. You know, in Germany, it's against the law to, to display the Nazi flag. You know, there are markers around the country in various sites and places, pe buildings where people live that were taken away, with markers that are uh, uh, acknowledging and remembering this crime that was committed. You know, but uh, here, uh, the Confederate flag is like the second American flag. And some people feel like it's the first. You know, and even those who may say, oh, well, you know, I don't feel that way, they're not doing anything about it. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, I talk about, and thank you, Jerry, and I see you giving me the, uh, giving me the hook. But one, <laughs> one of the things I talk about, when, I, yeah, when uh, uh, you know, we, I have this discussion about reparation, both parties, there has to be repair for the injured party, and there has to be rehabilitation for the person who committed the injury. When we look at an abusive relationship, when we look at the abused person, it's not enough to put a splint on their arm to repair the fracture, you know, and uh, uh, a cold compress on their eye and send them back into that same abusive relationship. You got to deal with the abuser as well. So when we're talking about reparations, we're talking about the human family and us working together to resolve, you know, this problem. And part of that has to be the, the recognition that Europeans, because they're melanin deficient, are not suprahuman, and that African people, because they're melanin enhanced, are not subhuman. I'll stop there. Honestly, I wasn't giving you the eye. <laughs> So we've got a lot of things that were put out on the table and a lot of things to unpack. Um, and I don't know who wants to start. We'll leave it up. I don't know if I'll pronounce your name correctly. This is for Pentia. Ooh, very good. Is a film like you showed here or a film similar being shown in the new Native American Museum in DC? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it should be. It should be. This is uh, this film. Um, when the uh, Truth and Reconciliation process was happening, uh, there were uh, documentarians that followed us everywhere we went. Um, the Upstander Project is the uh, the organization that produced this. So they um, their full length documentary will be done um, sometime next year. Uh, and in the meantime, they created this brief 13-minute one that we could use in, uh, in situations like this. We did have a meeting with the, uh, the director of the, um, the Smithsonian Museum that you're talking about um, and to talk about what we were doing and how um, it could be tied to that museum. Um, but um, I'm going to make a note of that. I don't know if they're showing the film or not. I would hope that they Another might. Another idea is we used to live in Connecticut, the National Tucket Pequot Native yeah. American Museum, yep. which we feel is better than one in D.C. Yeah. You should see if you get it shown there, because if it's not shown there as part of their lineup of yes. things yeah. they provide, because they get a lot of visitors there, a lot of school visitors. That would be very eye-opening. That's great. The Abbey Museum uh, in Maine uh, is in Bar Harbor, and that is one of the uh, museums that um, uh, 
tell some of the history of the Wabanaki people. The Wabanaki is the, the people, uh, people of the land where the sun first, the sun first touches the land <laughs> when it rises, right? Um, made me chuckle. Um, uh, so uh, the Abbey Museum, I know they have a whole display and show the film and have some other material. One other the question, work. when we were uh, vacationing up in Vancouver a few years ago, mm -hmm. we realized that they refer to their native people as First Nation, mm -hmm. Canadians are Second Nation, mm -hmm. which is a very telling lineup when you put that into practice. Yeah. And that really you know, shocked us and said, well, that's the way it should be. Yes. They, I, I'll say a couple things. One, I think we've done a lot to make Native uh, people invisible in this country. Um, uh, the number of people who don't even know that Native people exist, particularly on the East Coast, is staggering. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that uh, Canada just completed, I think about six months ahead of us, their Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was countrywide. Uh, related to the experiences of Native people in the boarding schools. Boarding schools were absolutely devastating um, um, to uh, Native children, Native families, and Native communities. Imagine, if, uh, if you live in a small town, imagine if anywhere up to like 50% of the kids just disappear. Um, the stories that we read about, um, you know, parents telling the kids to run out the back door and hide in the tall grass because uh, the authorities were coming to take the kids. It's really, uh, the, the devastating effect is just staggering. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jim Sorrell from Kingston, New Hampshire. Um, I've had some experience with the... Uh, the fine uh, DHHS Department of Maine, uh, including the Attorney General's Office, uh, a guardian ad litem, and the court, who all work together in a little, oh, I guess you, well, uh, anyway, they, they stole two kids, and they knew when they were doing it that the basis for their taking the kids actually violated constitutional law and they still went ahead and did it. Did it. Um, there was a law passed, the Adoption and Safe Family Act of 1997. I believe that act increased or created federal subsidies to states in order to help support the states in their ripping kids off, all right? Taking custody of children away from parents. And this, I think, has been an incentive for them to create a mill to take kids away from parents when they did, don't need to be, and they're willing to do it by breaking the law. And then my father further question is, has this, have you seen the impact that I'm talking about? And two, this is about adoption. Now, most states say, oh, we want to we want to reunify the family. I don't think that this law is designed to reunify the family. I think it's a financial uh, scheme that's actually encouraging the states to take these kids and put them up for adoption. I don't know if they get a reward for it or not, but it seems to me that this whole system has, because of federal funding, gotten way out of control. Um, what I understand about the Adoption and Safe Families Act is that it um, a compressed timelines for um, uh, kids would be reunified by a certain time, 15 or 15 months, and if not, then um, starting to work on adoption, and that there's penalties if uh, the states don't comply with the time frames for what they call permanency, either reunification or adoption. And so I think, it. my guess is that it have, probably has increased adoptions uh, and increased um, post-adoption subsidies as well. I am Swedish originally. <laughs> I came to this country because I married an American, and that was in 1949. And I was here for over 30 years, maybe, no, maybe more, for over 40 years before I ever heard about the, um, the Indian children being taken away from, I mean, the American Indian children being taken away from their parents and sent somewhere else where they weren't allowed to speak their language. And I think, I thought that was terrible. And I wonder how many Americans even know that. 
I think I think the many of the issues related to Native Americans have been made invisible, and that part of our strategy to overpower them, particularly in the East, the Native people in the East um, endured first contact longer. Um, there once were uh, over 20 tribes, uh, Native American tribes in the state of Maine. There's four today, um, and the rest have been killed off through. Uh, I think they experienced. Uh, a 98% population depletion in the, I forget what the first uh, time period. Some through disease, um, they have no um, immunity. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is uh, a fossil follow-up to Jerry Ann's. Um, and I was hoping to hear um, your reflections on the tense relationship between uh, reconciliation and assimilation. Um, I come from a Jewish background, my mother is a refugee from World War II, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors, and assimilation is, you know, word, it was a bad word when I was growing up. So um, how do you, how do you, you know, um, solve that, the complexity of that interface or talk about it? And then also, is there, uh, you know, institutionally in the United States, what has happened um, to try and push forward some reconciliation for the enslavement of of Africans and uh, on the national level, and if not nationally, then, then statewide, is there something? Yeah, uh, I, I think that um, there is uh, much pressure to uh, uh, support or to, uh, I guess, support or provoke, you know, to push people towards assimilation because in, uh, and I would say partly because of the way that power and privilege is allocated through these labels of black and white and how the society works, then there's pressure for if you don't support the, uh, uh, you know, the existing social institutions, you're punished. And if you do, you know, well then you're rewarded. And so there's this incentive to assimilate because you're rewarded. But what that does, it maintains, you know, the system. Uh, there have been a number of, of uh, uh, pushes for, one of, uh, for reparations. One of the earliest was led by this woman, Callie House, uh, after the uh, Civil War, who uh, started a movement for, they called it the ex-slave pension movement, you know, and uh, she was undermined by the government, you know, and uh, wrongfully, uh, uh, that's another story, but it's a good story, but it's another one. There's a book, uh, Mary Frances Berry wrote a book called My Face is Black is True, which is about Callie House, you know. Uh, uh, Queen Mother Moore is another uh, person who pushed for reparations. So there have been a, a number of different uh, m uh, pushes uh, for reparations. However, uh, there has been no institutional response, partly I suggest because, uh, and, and when we're talking about reparations, we, even though this issue began with uh, enslavement of Africans here in the U.S. as chattel property, it continues to today. It continues to today. So we're not, so when people talk about, oh, well, you know, everybody who was enslaved prior to 1865, you know, they're already dead. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But many of the social institutions and practices, customs, and mores continue even until today. And those vestiges are part of the, you know, of the issue that we're dealing with. Uh, a, a, a formal uh, a institutional government response to the issue has been, uh, State, uh, not state, but uh, Congressman John Conyers, who is a congressman from uh, Michigan, uh, in January of this year introduced a bill uh, into Congress called uh, House Resolution 40 that proposes uh, the establishment of a commission to study the uh, effect and the ongoing and residual effect of uh, African chattel slavery. And, the, and its vestiges on people of African descent here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So that is one concrete thing that, that people here today can uh, both uh, uh, investigate and get involved in around this particular issue. I'm, I made an attempt to uh, respond to your question. Hopefully I did. At least partly. Yes, I just had a couple of quick questions. I've heard that, uh, well, I've heard by many, uh, especially on the right wing, uh, saying how bad conditions are, violence is in South Africa today. Uh, and 
But I've also heard, though I, I don't have any kind of verification for it, so if, 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 if you could enlighten me on it, that would be great. I've also heard that uh, when the apartheid system was broken down, that the vast of, of the wealth was uh, left with the whites that, that left South Africa. And if that, if that you know, like the diamond mines, the, the, the De Beer family, uh, is that true? Or, uh, and who owns the wealth in South Africa now? And then the only other thing I wanted to, to comment on was uh, your comments about uh, education in Australia and how that's perpetuated uh, and, and in the U.S. And, 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 and I was going to, that's what I was going to say, I work in education all over the world, but especially in the United States and Canada as a special artist in residency. And, uh, and believe me, the, uh, as you probably well know, the, that brainwashing by omission, as uh, Emerson said, the, uh, the cruelest lies are taught in silence, is still being passed on. Uh, the, pub uh, the publishers of curriculum books <coughs> is created in, in uh, Texas, and the last time they published some books, they left out Thurgood Marshall because uh, they didn't think that was important enough to include. You know, so there's so much, uh, uh, how can those repar education reparations uh, happen in our country when everybody's so timid? Thank you. And at the highest level of our land, slaves were immigrants. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think part of the challenge uh, that we face is this otherization of the human family where, uh, you know, many people don't fully appreciate to the extent that the, uh, that American society is impoverished. You know, yes, African people are impoverished, but because they're impoverished, it's impoverishing society as a whole. You know, I mean, when we start talking about uh, uh, when uh, uh, the uh, Kelly uh, uh, Conway, was her name, the White House uh, person, start talking about alternative facts, you know, it's really difficult to deal with uh, uh, our friend uh, and President Donald Trump uh, when he comes up with these wacky ideas because, uh, you know, society as a whole has held on to such wacky ideas for so long. Wacky ideas about, you know, uh, First Nations people. Wacky ideas about, you know, people of African descent. So how do you, you know, I mean, when your whole, and when your sort of a, a social frame theory is, is created by these, you know, and, and based on these institutional lies that we persist in uh, affirming and, you know, work to confirm, then how do you know anything is possible? You know you can make up anything, and and it gets to get a pass. I I would just add to that. I spent this morning um, preparing some materials. We have a legislative hearing on Wednesday, um, proposing that uh, Columbus Day be changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. A fine right. example. <laughs> Of not just um, uh, not just uh, education by omission, but absolutely, uh, well, a friend of mine calls it not history but twistery, um, and uh, really turning uh, facts. Uh, I don't know, just creating whole new stories out of um, um, out of lies. Yeah, and I would add to go to your the first part of your question on crime. Yes. There is no other way to say it than there is serious crime in South Africa. And there is no one cause of it. However, many will say it is the expression of the oppression. And it's easy to free people and yet not give them the resources, not give them the homes. There are still significant, um, yeah, uh, just uh, metal tents that people live in and call it. Uh, uh, you know, there's still the townships. The township of Soweto, for instance, <coughs> would be from um, 
here to Boston. You know, we think of the township as some kind of a little bit. It isn't. There, in um, Kyalicha, in uh, Cape Town, one township is 450,000 people. So the sheer numbers, when you think that there were 75% non-whites when men, you know, during apartheid, that's why Mandela could have started a bloody revolution with just the the, the desire yeah, to tell people to do it. And so you were dealing with that white population and who knows where over those years the money went. I don't have a statistic for your second point about the wealth, um, but even black South Africans that did well began to buy into the system that oppressed the whole nation. And it, it goes along with what you know both of you have been saying. So that um, at the at the funeral for Walter Sisulu, Archbishop Tutu spoke. Now this was in a stadium in Soweto with forty thousand people at the funeral. And Archbishop Tutu was so powerful in saying that all the blood that was shed during these violent years of apartheid, that that wasn't shed so that this generation could just eke out all the material wealth and every other kind of you know, material benefit. And I, I came away from that just recognizing the complexity of the kind of institutional, um, it's in their DNA. And obviously when, when they see the world as we can so, more, or so much more now through media, uh, they want what was denied them. And uh, crime is definitely going to be a continued problem. You, you've probably read about President Zuma, very controversial. So it isn't a question of black and white. It's a question of a human being making choices. And some of the choices that have been made by those in power, African, black, and white, have not been for the, for the underlying you know, um, goal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Greed. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Please. Uh, in 1987, I had the opportunity to teach for a semester in northern Greenland. And before I went, I uh, read up a little on the local culture. And I went, most of what I read had to do with um, Alaska. And I went up expecting to find a uh, native population that was in a society in decline, because that's what I had read about. And when I got there instead, I found an incredibly vibrant, hopeful, dynamic society. And I, what, what happened? <laughs> I said, what happened? And what had happened was that many of you may not know that Greenland is an independent province of, um, of Denmark. And Denmark had decided to grant the indigenous people political autonomy. They're an independent province. And so within three generations of essentially first contact, of, of first modern contact, the indigenous people were given self-government. And I think that's a, a huge difference. Two years later, I was in Australia. And I took a course in a native Australian Aboriginal language. Uh, the 12 people in the class, 10 of them were stolen generation. And I thought this was incredible and incredibly sad. And, and when I came home, I had some friends over to dinner. And I was saying, you know, can you believe this is not ancient history? This is something ha happening now. 
And my friend who was over for dinner got a really funny look on her face. And she said, um, I have something for you. She went out to the car and she brought back a book of poetry called Stolen Daughter. Oh. I had not realized that Linda, my yeah, Linda, yeah, that she herself had been in the United States a stolen generation mm -hmm. person. And that really brought it home. Yeah. And since then I've paid a lot of attention. But uh, she, Linda also said that, that when she was in college and trying to find her, her family, that she um, the, the BIA said to her, well, wait, you're in college. You're doing really well. Uh, didn't we do well by you? <laughs> and, and I think it's in a truth and reconciliation standpoint, it's important to realize that a lot of the people who are doing the oppressing think they're doing something good. But I also think that the, um, the Greenland bottle, where I think they had the enormous advantage of not having had generations and generations of a systematic oppression built in. I think that helped a lot. And I think it's a, a third model to look mm, at. That's great. I would say the, you know, the US uh, board, uh, Indian boarding schools followed a strategy of, um, of US troops massacring native people. I mean, that's, the stories are, that's not who we think we are, but those are our stories, you know? And, um, and so suddenly the boarding schools do seem like a progressive move until you hear the stories of what happened in the boarding schools. And their strategy was, as Esther said in the film, to kill the Indian in that man. It was not to give a supportive educational experience, but it was to, to um, to destroy uh, the existence of, of Indian people. And, you know, when we look back on the truth and reconciliation process in Maine, and, the, and it did some good things, and there's much more that's needed to be done, if we had it to do over, we would drop the term reconciliation from the title, because reconciliation is yet to come. We need to spend way more time in a... Uh, in a place of acknowledgement, in a place of understanding the truth and recognizing who we are in this the grand scheme, the role that we played and play, uh, and understanding the things that um, got set up in our institutions and legal structures and our institutions being comprised of people. So um, that um, that uh, education and engagement, sitting in circles together and really trying to integrate this into how we view the world and, and how we view this territory that we're in, I think is, is really important in order to be able to identify strategies of repair um, and, uh, and then following repair, then perhaps we will achieve reconciliation. And we do this side by side. The Truth and Reconciliation in Maine was the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was established by both sides, if you will, um, coming together and saying, let's look at this and try and, uh, and do something different. It was grassroots. It was, um, and, and um, we got the endorsement of tribal and state leaders, um, but it was grassroots, and that's a whole other story. I'd be happy to talk more about that. Just to follow up, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission came into being when Archbishop Tutu was visited by a young man who had been part of the anti-apartheid movement. And he came and he talked about his wife being, and he being incarcerated and, you know, uh, threatened and all the rest. And he said, you know, he said, we have got to do something in this country because we're not facing the truth of ourselves. And Archbishop Tutu said that was the seed that grew the, the TRC. Um, I wanted to mention about Linda and Fuso and Stolen Daughter. Linda used to come um, to my world religions classes and um, the story, uh, it, I couldn't help but think of it all through uh, the, fir the video today and some of the things that you have shared, uh, Panthea. Um, 
But one thing she said that, you know, just added a graphic image to what was done to all of the children. She found herself not in an institution, she might as well have been, she was adopted by an Irish family in the Bronx. And she's funny telling about it, but you know how humor covers the, is a mask because she was always the Indian when they played Cowboys and Indians. <laughs> she never, she was different. She didn't know why, knew nothing. <clears throat> so that built up, and her, her little book, I don't know if it's still in print, but I, uh, Stolen Daughter is really worth um, reading. It, it's quite powerful. The other, um, the other thing I just wanted to add, when I'm listening to ourselves here, I'm thinking, we have, as w those majority here, white people have to start <laughs> with the truth and talking about revisionist history and what's in and what isn't. I think Debbie Irving does a very, very impressive job talking about being <laughs> white and not knowing. She said, I was a history major. Why didn't I know what the GI Bill was doing to prevent black families, black veteran families from moving into the GI housing? It wasn't in the law, of course, but it was in the practice of the realtors who warned the white veterans families that if they sold their homes to a black that, you know, there goes the neighborhood. But she does this throughout the book in a way that is so honest. She's not blaming, but her first chapter says, things my mother couldn't teach me. Because her mother was also part of the system that created this bubble that we got things with by uh, deserving them, by earning them. And her father got to Harvard, but how come his buddies, who didn't happen to be white, didn't get there? Was it such um, intellectual acuity that got him there? And just, no, it wasn't. And the lovely camp they had in Maine, and the idea that they could go up to Maine, and she said, who told, who didn't tell me where that land came from that was given to us? And she talks about feeling as a five-year-old, so proud when they would go to Maine and at the end of their week or two or three or summer would collect all of the, you know, once a week, she said, they'd collect everything they had left over and all of the other things and then bring them over to the place where you could go, like the dump, really. And she said, I would look out the back of the window as we left, and the toys that we had discarded, or the household goods, or, would be put around the edge of the place, things that were you know, usable. And she'd watch as the people came out of the bushes and took what they could, and she said, I go back feeling so good about what I had done, you know, and that's where I have found such um, cruel awakening. Of I wanted to make a couple of comments um, uh, regarding one is, and I, I'll, I'll be sort of short. <laughs> but first, I want to say that you know um, Eleanor Freiberg and I, we we've, we've known each other for. A number of years, <clears throat> colleagues worked together over at the university and all. But the issue that I raised earlier about this idea that that uh, is reflects the damage that's been done by to the human family by the crime against humanity of African child slavery is reflected in someone like Eleanor Freiberger, who's accomplished world traveler you know, college professor, and she's locked into this thing about white and black, white South Africans and black South Africans. We're really talking about power and privilege. And if we can't get to, if we can't move out of that space, then we're going to continue locked into this orbit where we're circling around the same thing. But I, I took the mic to say that 
uh, the earlier uh, uh, question about that uh, there was a reference made to uh, people being well-meaning. Well, that's the rehabilitation part of the reparations question. You know, it's not a, you know, I mean, they, you got to have that balance. And also, part of reparations is internal repair. Yes. Because some things nobody else can give you. They can try and take it away, but nobody else can give you. So within these communities, there also has to be internal repair. And that's part of what I hear, uh, you know, being said, or what I think about when you talk about the Greenland experience. <laughs> Hi. I, I really wasn't intending to interrupt you at all. <laughs> yeah, I was prompted to stand. I have to say that because I, I'm fascinated by everything all of you have had to say. I'm uh, very eager to hear um, your responses. So my name is Lara Croft Berry. I'm from Epping, New Hampshire, and I'm a librarian, which heads into my question for you, which is related to what you just said, um, Mr. Um, I can totally get behind the idea that philosophically and um, scientifically the racial binary does not exist. But as soon as we start talking about socially and politically, I am very nervous about trying to eradicate that. And I would just love to hear from the panelists talk a little more about that. Um, for example, the research that we do regarding um, that, 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 that informs policy regarding things like, in our country, police brutality and equal pay. Mm -hmm. I don't see how we can <coughs> do that kind of research and create policy when we're not asking those questions on the government forums. I'd love to hear from any of you who want to speak to that. Thank you. Well, I'll just speak briefly. And uh, <laughs> your, your question reminds me of, uh, I remember, you know, in my younger days when I was living in Chicago, uh, um, and Chicago had a 10% set aside for, you know, 10% set aside for my, the city of Chicago. So we have a 10% set aside for minority contractors. And, uh, you know, there were people at the time who were saying, well, why are minority contractors being limited to 10% of the fund? <laughs> you know, I mean, the issue, I, I think your, your question is, uh, I was talking to my buddy um, Chuck Collins yesterday. And we ended up talking about the same thing. Part of what we have to do is to create the, the space to have this conversation and to translate it into policy, practice, you know, uh, social customs and tradition. You know, because as long as we, unless we break out of this orbit, then we'll remain there. So part of the challenge that we have, that we have to deal with is figuring out how do we make the difference. You know, I mean, you don't have the answer, and I don't either, because we have been compliant. You know, uh, uh, Kenneth Clark, as part of the uh, 1955 uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, did a study called the Doll Test. You know, and that is telling us that there's something going on in society, in the background. You know, there's the uh, in the noise of society that's given this, uh, you know, this message. I think that this idea uh, called uh, white supremacy and white privilege has to be dealt with as a public health problem. There was a, a guy, a sociologist, uh, um, uh, Bobby Wright, who wrote a book talking about the psychopathic racial personality. But basically he was saying that, uh, you know, people, uh, non-Europeans aren't viewed as fully human, so anything is fair game. However you treat them, it's fair game. And what, in order to make the change, we gotta, you know, deal with this, this uh, healing the human family and deal with this issue of repair and rehabilitation and work towards a, you know, uh, integration of the human family that is about uh, working towards recognizing, you know, our common humanity. And while that's not easy, one of the things we got to do actually is to begin to work on policy, both public policy, social policy. So, uh, and one thing that you can do uh, after you leave here today is contact your congressperson and ask them to co-sponsor H.R. 40, House Resolution 40, mm -hmm. as a way of beginning to move this question. That's my take. 
Um, I just want to say a couple of things. One, I, you know, I think I'm probably going to say it in a, the same way, the same thing in a slightly different way, but it is, um, it is our job to like really understand who we are and how we have gotten to this. So I think just continuing to find ways to, um, to acknowledge what has happened and recognize that, um, that, you know, um, uh, my friend Esther was telling me one day that one of her friend's um, eight-year-old daughter came home from school one day and said, you know, we should be really proud to be Passamaquoddy because uh, someday people are going to only know about us from books because we won't exist anymore. Eight years old. Um, and so, um, I mean, this sort of is answering your question. Like, we have to be able to recognize the things that we have done, um, the crimes we have committed, the harms we have done, uh, and and so that visibility of peoples needs to be available um, in that process of recognition. So, um, yeah. The idea of um, not using certain terms. We all we know we need a new language. We need a new semantic. Yeah. But we are, at some point, breaking down something. And that is the layer and la layers and layers of the imposed um, European and a kind of infusion of white being better and all of these unconscious. So I think the idea, as it is in ethics, the first thing we have to do is wake up. And in order to wake up and to unpack all that, as Jerry Ann said today, we were going to try to unpack so much. And I think that's part of the process. Um, so that we hopefully will create a language, and we know underneath it means the human language of identity with you and with others. In the meantime, I guess, we shouldn't be saying, can the TRC model work? It's got to. We can call it something else, but as you've been calling for today, will it? And um, is that we need to do the work. And whatever that takes, whether it's a book, a movie, something in our libraries that, you know, that light bulb goes on. And, and then we begin to question. And the problem is we've been so complacent. Just we've got the we got the, the comfort level. Yeah. Complicit. Yeah. So uh, is this on? Okay. So when Jerry Ann handed me the microphone, I actually had a question that you've all been answering, and I think truth is at the heart of it. T J Wheeler left a couple minutes ago, but he and I were on a committee that was created by the Greater Piscataqua Community Foundation back in the mid-1990s. And he came and sat at the first meeting that we had and said, he knows a lot of people who said, I didn't own any slaves, not my fault. And you know, it really surfaced in me, wow, okay, that got my attention. What do I need to start thinking about? And so I've come to a place where the shame that I would have is if I didn't start talking about the truth. Like, okay, this stuff happened. But telling the truth about it is what's really important. So I have, a, this is sort of a question that we can't answer right now. Mm. But there's policy, but then there's stuff that we can do right here in our own community. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think needs to happen with every historical house in New Hampshire and in this community is to have a plaque that is the same literature everywhere that says, this wouldn't, and maybe it shouldn't be as confrontational <coughs> about this, but the essence has to be, this house wouldn't exist with all its beautiful fine furniture, were it not for free labor. You know, there has to be that consistent statement as one way of beginning to make reparation. It's not a cash payment, but it's just a recognition this happened. And so then I'm gonna sit down, because, but I just have one more thing to say. And that is, could we please give Jerry Ann a round of applause? You organized such an amazing yeah. program. Can I suggest one other thing that you put on those plaques is to identify um, the land that that house, yes. that building sits on, mm -hmm. yeah. and who 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 lived on that land and who was eradicated so that that building could exist. For uh, yeah, for yeah. example, Candace and Palm Spring. I give these tours for the Black Heritage Trail too. <laughs> 
um, Candace and Palm Spring were probably part of the Underground Railroad. And I won't get into the details of why that is, but when I take people on the tour and I show the house, I have to say, that is where the house was. It doesn't exist anymore. Whereas I look at the Langdon House and everybody knows it's there and you can see it. It's, it's invisible and, and re creating, you know, making, raising it to visibility because something happened to that house and it was important people who lived there. So, yeah. And they did important things. Well, and, and um, you know, the Abenaki tribe has, uh, has failed to get, uh, or has not fit, they've not failed. The U.S. government's failed to provide federal recognition for the Abenaki tribe. Why? Because they got the heck out of here when the war was happening. They, they, they got out of the way so that they could make it safe for their children and families because of what the colonizers are doing. And so then, you know, like there's no proof that they belong. Same for the Huma people in Louisiana. When the Trails of Tears, not the Trail of Tears, the Trails of Tears were happening where uh, Andrew Jackson made sure that the Chickasaw and the Choctaw and the Cherokee and the Seminole were moved out of the way and moved west, the Huma people in Louisiana moved into the bayou. They went into the swamp and so nobody wanted to follow them there until when? Until gas and oil was discovered there. And they, they've taken that land, they've spoiled it with waste. There's 50,000 Huma people, 15,000 Huma people who can't get federal recognition. Why? Because they're afraid of a land claim. Um, and those, like, so that's that's today. For 30 years, they've been fighting for federal recognition. And our system of government, who has the audacity to be able to recognize that a tribe exists, those, those structures, that's, that's our work to change those structures. That's our work. Could I just add to this? District 6 Museum in Cape Town, South Africa, is actually given because that whole District 6, which was just wasteland, therefore black South Africans and colored people, which is the term for the um, Indian and, and others mixed, um, were there until Cape Town started to need that land, because it was adjacent to downtown, they moved the entire community off. And today you can walk into this museum, and on the floor is the entire map of District 6. And you can walk through up and down every street. And the day that we were there, there was a, a gentleman from India with his two teenage daughters showing them where he had lived, but of course had no record of. So another practical way of honoring those who had to give up what they owned.